Hi. Well, here we are. We are entering the second term of Barack Obama and about, flush with the victory of November, to head into the spring of discontent. No question about it. There are going to be fights that will result in cuts to education, housing, health care, Head Start, you name it. A lot of people feel that for all the excitement of the election season, the new administration is feeling like a pretty glum place. What real change is likely to come? Probably not that much. How much are we going to see, see real wages grow? Probably not much at all. So why is it then that our next guest, Gar Alperovitz, says that in fact we might be witnessing the prehistory of the next American Revolution? What do you think? Gar is the author of a new book, What Then Must We Do? Straight talk about the next American Revolution. He also teaches at the University of Maryland in the Department of Economics. Gar, welcome. Glad to have you. Good to be here. A am I describing this moment incorrectly? Enthusiasm post-election, slight gloom around about now? Well, I think that's about right, and, and rightly so. The, the, the president is committed to a trillion point five in cuts for the next decade. And at the same time, he's talking about trying to boost the economy. I suspect we'll get very little change in the unemployment rate, in the real unemployment rate, which is probably about 15 percent if you counted the people who just don't show up anymore. So, and I look at this, you know, I wear two hats. I'm a historian and a political economist. When I say the revolution, I mean that we are entering an era like the progressive era, the land of the 19th century, where in the next two, three decades, the problems get worse because the political system can't solve the basic problems. And that produces the kind of developing reactions we're seeing both in terms of protest, but also many of the states and localities which the press doesn't have any interest in, doesn't have any reporters who can cover it, but there's a lot going on because the pain levels are growing at the local level and the state level, and that's where the action always grows. But a whole lot of people on Wall Street or invested in the stock market would say, you're mad, the market is up, we're doing great. The market, absolutely, at that level, the uh, elites in the top market are doing very well. And as they're doing well, many, many, many millions of people, you know, tens of millions of people are not doing well. We're about to see a major crisis in the elderly because very few people have savings for retirement and the pain levels are going to grow there, which means it's going to be their kids under pressure. And that's another source of the difficulties. The, the main point to do is to look at the long trends. And there is decay on virtually every front over the last 30 years in terms of income distribution, climate change, environment, poverty. If you counted poverty the way every other nation in the world counts it, a quarter of our society is in poverty. That is half of the median income. So there is of underlying decay in the system that, as I say, the political system can't handle, and bound to come with that are both protests, political protests. Much more interesting is changes in the institutions, worker-owned co-ops, neighborhood ownership. Changing the ownership of capital is happening in many, many parts of the country. There are 10 million people in worker-owned companies of one kind or another, 130 million people in co-ops of one kind or another. These are Change, going to the question of who owns the capital, which is the central issue of, of any kind of a corporate or capitalist system. And I think that's going to build out of the decay and out of the pain. Well, a lot in what you just said, but let's start with some examples. When you say there are examples, name a few. Well, it depends. The most interesting one, of course, is in Cleveland, the Evergreen Co-ops, which some people have heard about. This is a, in Cleveland, Ohio today, a group of worker-owned co-ops brought together with a nonprofit corporation so that they build community, not just individual worker co-ops, and a revolving fund based on the Mondragon co-ops in, in the Basque region of Spain, so that they kick back to the revolving fund to build more worker co-ops. So that's the complex. Um, they've got three or four of them on the ground right now, including now the largest urban greenhouse in the United States, producing, this is a very, a very interesting, three million heads of lettuce a year. That means every Monday and every Tuesday and every Wednesday, 26,000 heads of lettuce are put to seed. And the people overseeing this are workers, members of the community. Is that what you just described? It's, it's a joint venture. That is, the workers have participation and control in their co-ops, but they're not free-ranging. They can't get up and go. It's a community building, so a nonprofit corporation and a revolving fund aimed at building the community is part of this. And the, the distinction there that's more, even more interesting is a lot of taxpayer money in hospitals and universities. 
the big hospitals and universities in that area have been brought to purchase from this complex. They buy three trillion, uh, three billion dollars a year in goods and services, plus their salaries, plus their construction, and some part of that can help build this complex. So you have the political sphere actually investing in this yeah. experiment or in this new type of enterprise. Yeah. And several other cities are doing something very similar. Atlanta, Pittsburgh, a number of cities are, are exploring it now, which tells you, and this is the paradigm, there is no answer in most urban areas for redeveloping low-income areas. The corporations aren't going to do it. Small business isn't going to do it. The government doesn't have any money. And that logic, no answer, is forcing these innovations. And we could, we could talk about many other levels, but that's the paradigm logic of, I think, of this decade and the next decade that gives me some hope that we're laying the groundwork for something that could get beyond. There's some history here that you write about in this book, and because I covered it a bit last year, I just want you to mention it for our audience, and that's the history of the Youngstown, Ohio Steelwork, yep. and what steel workers have done in the last year, very different from 30 years ago. It's one of the first big steel mills to go down was Youngstown Sheet and Tube. 5,000 people lost their job one day. They were all pink -sick. It was dramatic because it hadn't happened. And they got together with a religious coalition and put together a plan. I helped design the plan for them, uh, which was a worker community ownership of a large mill. And they got enough financing to finance a very sophisticated technical plan. And they put it together, uh, and the Carter administration was going to support it for $100 million. And somehow, not surprisingly, that disappeared. The Steel Workers Union, the international, was against these local guys at that point in time. They didn't want anybody messing with ownership, and they didn't want these upstart guys challenging their leadership. That's all changed radically. Now the steel workers are leading the fight to produce worker-owned co-ops with unions built into them, and they're really gaining interest from other parts of the labor movement. So you're seeing the institutional shift. And again, from my point of view, viewing it historically, that's another sign of the change. Not only problems that can't be solved by other means, but also an evolution of ideas and evolution of institutions beginning to realize they've got to move in another direction. When the steel, steel workers move, they can actually move large capital into doing this, and I think they will. One of the things that's interesting is your book describes the sort of um, dominant system as being perhaps a little less dominant or hegemonic than you might think. And you mentioned some extraordinary examples, in addition to the ones you've mentioned. Um, the Texas Permanent School Fund, yeah. Texas. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, if you, if you get below these big abstractions, they won't let us do it, right? In Texas, for almost 100 years, they have had land in ownership of the state and oil in ownership of the state. Wait, doesn't that sound like nationalized? Socialism. It's owners owned land and the profits from this publicly owned trust are used to fund education. That is socialism. Now, if you told most Texans that that's what's happening in their state, they'd say, no way. No, yeah, they, they probably would say it's a good thing and because it's Texan. And, and they don't see it under, they don't see it through the idea of, of socialism. They, they see it as a good thing for our state. And indeed, if you look around, and part of the, the point of this book is to probe, and you find this kind of thing, land trusts, cities owning, kind of one of the big things that's happening, 750 cities setting up companies to capture methane, public ownership, to capture methane from the garbage and turn it into electricity and to make money and to create jobs. So if you actually get beyond big abstractions, because the problems can't be solved other ways, there are these innovations going on at the grassroots level. Uh, I'm a realist. This is all preliminary stuff. But nonetheless, they're introducing into American culture, even into American ideology, the idea of democratizing the ownership of wealth in real human terms that people can understand. Mm -hmm. So it has a very powerful potential cracking the ideology sphere as well. It's a, it's a Gramscian development, if you like. It's a very interesting sub, sub rosa movement that's growing around these kinds of things, where you're beginning to see this kind of exploring public ownership or democratization democratizing wealth. It seems to me that's what distinguishes this is from the, the traditional liberalism, which let the corporations own it, let the banks own it, will try to regulate them. This is actually the paradigms all involve democratizing ownership in a, also a very American way. When you call it explicitly the next American revolution, 
it gets to that very point. I mean, our model of kind of liberalism, of change, of putting a, a, a check on the concentration of power of the banks and the corporate elite, our model has been countervailing power. Yes. You have the Chamber of Commerce, we'll have the AFL-CIO. Now, you can argue about whether they're equally matched or treated fairly equally, um, but that's been the model. Mm -hmm. That's not what you're talking about. No, in indeed, that model and the word countervailing power, that came from John Kenneth Galbraith, who believed that and near the end of his life said, that's over. Mm -hmm. And he was right, because mainly he had in mind labor unions. And they went from 35% of the labor force organized. They're now down at 11%, less than 7% in the private sector. That force is not able to countervail. Now, let's do whatever we can. I'm for, I'm for the labor movement. But it has declined radically. What you're seeing here, take, for instance, Vermont, where they're, getting, they're going to have single-payer health care. When you get single-payer health care in Vermont, and they will have it, shortly because of the election gives them that power, they will displace other insurance companies because the prices will be better and the service will be better. And the public banking, if you put in a bank that people like, as they do in North Dakota, you're beginning a displacement movement rather than simply countervailing. And a true transformation is going to have to trans transform who owns capital and how institutions are organized. And again, if you see it historically rather than it's going to happen tomorrow, you can see this buildup in many parts of the country, which gives us a shot, at least, of thinking about building over time with the political movements, at the same time thinking about different institutions rather than the old idea, let, let them own the wealth, and we'll try to countervail or we'll try to beg one or the other. Now, we talked with Rick Wolf not long ago, and he said, yeah, a lot of people can make a co-op without changing the power relations of the state. Right. If you just change that the workers own something, but the structure of the business remains the same, have you really changed anything? I totally agree. I, I agree. I think this is the prehistory. We're introducing into American consciousness the idea that it is important to change the ownership of wealth and the experience and practice of doing that. That is only step one. The idea system is often neglected. Mm. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I write books. And I don't think ideas matter most of the time because power matters. But when the idea system is collapsing, when people don't believe the old stuff anymore, then we're really important to give, clarify what the direction is and why. And then ideas can be very powerful. We believe in ideas here at Grit TV. Um, <laughs> to get very practical, though, we're living in the northeast of the United States, affected by Hurricane Sandy. There are big discussions in this part of the country about how to rebuild, how to recover. Mm -hmm. If you had your way, for example, you and your colleagues in a cooperative kind of a way, um, about rebuilding, say, the Rockaways, without getting into the, the, the specifics, how would you do it? I mean, if you, if you had a chance to model a community according to what you describe as your sort of checkerboard of, of possible interventions mm -hmm. that could lead towards this change, what would you do? Well, what you, and the word checkerboard is interesting. People, there are some states you can't do much at all. And some states, I talk, we talked about Vermont, North Dakota, Washington State, possibly New York, some parts of it. That's the checkerboard we can play on lots of squares, and we'll see what we can get more of them. I would begin with all the practical stuff that's happening and say, why don't we do it all in one place? Why don't we put in place a serious public bank? Why don't we put in place serious worker-owned co-ops linked together in the way that this Cleveland effort is? By the way, the Cleveland efforts are all green, top of the line. They're very serious about their green quality. I would get serious also about working with the rest of the region, which is not just New York. This is a big country, and regions are going to be part of this. So the Northeast is one of the furthest along in trying to set up regional structures, and the whole coast has got similar problems. So you could begin to say, let's have a regional plan mm. as well. So those would be the elements, changing the ownership of actual firms, put in the finance system, begin building a green structure, looking to regionalism, and working on the models that are already on the ground that demonstrate what you can do. Begin doing that, you, I think, simultaneously, you've got the idea systems. Let's talk about the future in a very different way. So I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a cautious optimist, but a historian. If we're serious about this, it is a process over decades. And what we have the chance of doing in, in our time is laying down the groundwork, maybe, and it's all good stuff to do no matter what, so we ought to be doing it anyway, but maybe of laying the foundations as the failures continue of something transformative. What can people do if they say, uh, 
I don't want to have that much responsibility over my workplace. I just want to go in, do my nine to five, be told what to do and leave. Relax. <laughs> that's, that's fine too. I think that's always going to happen. People tend to think you've got to participate, but you know, that's, that's another way to deal with a very affluent system. People ought actually to be, have that choice. We do not have an economic problem. How can I say that? If you divided the current lousy economy up, it's about $200,000 for every family of four today, even in the horrible economic mess we're in. So we have a political problem of how to manage the richest economy in the world, and that's what we're talking about. How do you change the power that controls that economy? Could I take the 100000 and work less hard? You bet. Split the work week in half, and you got a 20-hour work week. Carl Perowitz is the author of What Then Must We Do? Straight talk about the next American revolution just out from Chelsea Green.